you are alive. Good morning, and welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. Uh, for those of you who are joining us uh, as driving, if you could honk your horns so we know you can hear us okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. And to those who are joining us um, online via Facebook Live, good morning and welcome to you, as well as to those who are listening to this via our call-in number. Uh, my name is Pastor Michael. I'm excited for you to join us this morning, this uh, last Sunday before Christmas Eve. Um, a couple quick announcements. On Christmas Eve, we will uh, be having one service. Um, it'll be accessible online through our Facebook page, um, as well as a link from our uh, website to a YouTube 
uh, channel, so you can access it either way, whatever you're more comfortable with, as well as it will be available uh, on the phone. Um, everything will start at 7 o'clock, um, so I invite you to join us uh, for that. We decided that not knowing what the weather's going to be like, we didn't want to risk anybody's uh, health or safety in trying to do something in person, um, especially given uh, some of the roads around here. So um, I hope you can join us for Christmas Eve um, with your uh, family and loved ones, whoever you may be uh, with right now. Um, and I think even though it's going to be a little different this year, I think it's still going to be a really uh, good and meaningful time for everyone. Um, I don't think I have any other announcements. Does anyone else have any other announcements that I'm forgetting? I don't think so. Cool. All right. Oh, um, I think we are still collecting uh, money for those families and stuff we were doing. Um, I th there should be something in your bulletin on that, I hope. Um, so e that would be the only other thing. Um, now I'm done. I promise. Um, <laughs> Uh, let us come to a time and an attitude of worship and praise for our God. Good morning, Stony Creek. My name is Laurel Ear. I am your liturgist for this morning. Please join me in the call to worship. My soul magnifies the Lord. My, my spirit, spirit rejoices, rejoices in, in God, God my, my Savior. Savior. For the Mighty One has done great things. And, and holy is, is God's, God's name. name. All these hymns this morning are such favorites of mine. I'm so happy. The first one is, it came upon a midnight clear. <clears throat> Join us now together in the opening prayer. Mighty God, God 
Your Your faithfulness faithfulness is magnified in the coming of your your Son, in the long-awaited birth of the promised Messiah. May May we, like Mary, proclaim your greatness as we rejoice in our Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our second hymn is We Three Kings. Now is the time for our Advent reflection, a reading from the Gospel of Luke. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the loneliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Have mercy, or his mercy, is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Andrew Purves puts forth that the content of the new work of God is not given in 
lofty theological images, but as the ethic of a changed world order. In concrete and specific terms, Mary sings in the language of revolution, a turning around to record her understanding of the great reversals that have unfolded. I'll bet we must add in a hidden way. Trisha Lyons Centerfit opines that though her song of justice, or through her song of justice, Mary calls us to be change agents for a better world for all. She also proposes that we need one another's affirmation just as Mary needed Elizabeth's to live into God's plan for the world. I ask that you would take a few moments and consider this question, what gift do you offer to those who are oppressed? Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Make me an instrument of change in some small way and grant me the courage to think in grander terms. Amen. If you would please join together with me in our prayer of illumination. Astonishing God, send your Holy Spirit upon us as we await the coming of your Son. Fill us with good things that we may conceive your reign on earth and glorify you according to your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from 2 Samuel, verse 7, chapter 7, verse 1 through 11. God's covenant with David. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord have, had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And, and evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Joining Mary's joyful song, our souls proclaim the greatness of the Lord and our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. With humble and grateful hearts, let us bring our offerings to God. Um, and I also want to remind you that if you are joining us uh, virtually, you can also um, make your offerings and tithes from our website. There is a link for online giving. Thank you.
If you would please join us in singing the doxology. Holy God, your love is magnified in the gift of your Son, whom you so freely share with us. Bless these gifts that we offer to lift up the lowly and fill the hungry in your coming reign of justice and peace. In Christ's name, amen. I invite you now to a time and an attitude of prayer. Holy God, we are just days away from the celebration of the birth of your Son, our Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, into this world. This has been such a strange year. We are not able to do many things that we normally would out of calls for safety for one another. But that will not stop your son from coming. Because your love and grace cannot be stopped. And you offer them to all creation. This morning as we gather together, whether in our cars or online or over the phone, we think of the many people who are ill and in need of healing, whether physically, emotionally, or mentally, whether fighting this COVID virus or cancer or other illnesses or injuries. We lift up those who are mourning. So many lives have been lost. In this time of year, not being able to be with our loved ones makes our mourning that much more challenging. But God, we also see your work in the world. We, we feel the hope that is resonating. We see it in the dedication and work of those who work to keep us safe and healthy, the doctors and nurses and surgeons and lab technicians and research scientists and so many others involved in the healthcare process. We see the hope that is resonating 
and the work of those who are trying to keep us safe in this world, those who serve in our armed forces and military, those who serve as firefighters and police officers and first responders. God, we ask that you would guide them in all that they do, in their words and their actions. And Lord, we pray for the safety of all and that those who are far away from their homes, their loved ones, we pray for an end to this pandemic and to the conflict in the world that separates us, that we might be able to be with one another again in person. We also feel the hope that is resonating in our country and in countries around the world. While there are still dangers and issues and controversies and fighting and confusion and rage, still amongst all of that, the hope of your coming Savior shines through. We ask that you would help us to see one another as you see us, as your beloved children, all equal in your eyes, worthy of life, worthy of being, worthy of love. And we especially ask for strength this morning. Strength to see us through not just the end of this week or even the end of this year, but continued strength as we look towards a hopeful end to this pandemic. Strength to get us through the times when we are lonely and afraid. Strength to call on you in prayer and praise. All of these things, as well as those we keep quietly in our own hearts and minds, we lift to you this day in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive, forgive us, us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Let us confess our sins to the one whose mercy endures from generation to generation. If you would please join together with me in our prayer of confession. Faithful God, we know that you are always there to guide us, yet we often make plans without listening to you and discover that our human agendas can drown out our ability to hear your will for us. We repent of these faults and turn to you in love. Forgive our offenses pardon our sins, that our lives may magnify your holy name forever. Amen. Please take a few moments for silent prayer and confession. Beloved children of God, by the faith of Christ, your sins are forgiven. Blessed be the God of our salvation, whose mercy is everlasting. Amen. Let us join together now for our affirmation of faith with the Advent Creed. We, we believe, believe in, in God, God the Father, Father creator of heaven and earth, and earth the, the one who is, is full of patience, patience who is not afraid of silence, who does not need to fill each moment with activity and noise, 
the one who is beyond bluster and flurry, and who does not jostle for attention. We believe in God the Son, Savior of creation, who slipped into Bethlehem one night, mostly unnoticed, who lived 30 years without headlines or hurry, who frequently took time alone with his patient father, who waited for the right time to become the suffering servant, who stood quietly before the noise of his accusers, whose silence overpowered their words, who died, then rose again on a quiet Sunday morning. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens, empowers, renews, and refreshes, sometimes arriving with obvious power, sometimes with the quiet breath of a whisper. We believe in one God who patiently waits for us and who longs for us to do the same. Amen. The next scripture reading is from Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God who through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is the first Noel.
Our third scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. This section is titled, The Birth of Jesus Foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you would please join me again in an attitude of prayer. Loving God, you offer so much to your creation, from mercy to grace to love to hope. This year has felt completely hopeless to much of the people in this world. We have seen millions die from a global pandemic. We have seen nations set ablaze with political unrest. We have seen marches crying out for justice and equality for the oppressed and the downtrodden. There has been rage, confusion, hatred, controversies, and much too much suffering and pain. So many of the things that are a part of our identity, a part of our daily routine, and a part of the world as we understand it have been stripped away. It is no surprise that feelings of utter, utter hopelessness have risen in so many people around the world. We ask for your help, loving God. We ask for strength. We ask for healing. We ask for signs of hope. And now may the words of my mouth, meditations in our hearts together in this place, be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today is the fourth Sunday in Advent, and we will be closing out our Advent sermon series, Stripped Away What is Left. Over the last three weeks, we have talked about some of the things that we have seen stripped away, both in Scripture and in our world right now. Mostly things that have caused us pain, or at the very least, sadness to no longer have as the norm of our days. Typically, this time of year is filled with gift-giving, delicious food, time with friends and loved ones, and, and countless memories that 
will stay with us for a lifetime and continue to bring smiles to our faces. But this year is not typical. This year has been a bust in many ways. For almost the entire year, we have been battling against this COVID-19 virus, trying to get it under control and trying to save lives. It hardly feels like a holiday season for many of us. I know I am still struggling myself to find the feelings that I normally experience around this time of year. The Advent and Christmas seasons are two of my absolute favorites, from the anticipation of the birth of Jesus to the celebration of his arrival. And one of the struggles that I think a lot of us have right now, again, myself included, is that we're still trying to pretend that everything is okay. Parents and teachers are trying to put on brave faces for their children. Grandparents are trying to make it seem like they are simply fine connecting with their children and grandchildren over phone and video calls instead of seeing them in person. Our healthcare professionals are trying to be strong and reassuring to those who have caught this virus and may not have much time left in this world. And all of that pretending, all of that trying to make others think everything is okay, well, it takes a great toll. I cannot speak for all of you, but, but I'm tired. No, I, I take that back. I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm even beyond exhausted. At times I feel like, like a zombie, like I'm just going through the motions each day, and I'm not even sure which day it is. But as I have said these last three weeks, I believe that there is healing in naming the pain and suffering we experience to, to say out loud that everything is not okay. We are tired. We are broken. We are struggling. Over these last three weeks, we have talked about the loss of community and how community of being children of God will always keep us connected. We have talked about the loss of health and life and how the word of God still gives us hope and promise and grace and love. And we have talked about the loss of tradition and how in some cases losing some of that tradition is a good thing and how tradition is not what makes this time of year possible to celebrate. Today, as we close, we are going to use our reading from Luke's Gospel, which, as I mentioned before, is titled, The Birth of Jesus Foretold. So much like last week, some of you may be wondering what could be stripped away in a section of Scripture that is titled, The Birth of Jesus Foretold. This is the good stuff, right? Well, let us look back in those verses, shall we? In the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee and Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? So the one here who is having something stripped away is Mary. Mary was a virgin, and that was an extremely big deal when getting married back in those days. If a man were set to marry a woman and it was found out that she was not a virgin, she could be tossed away, and in some cases even stoned to death. And now Mary is pregnant. She is still a virgin, but is pregnant, and trying to explain that is not going to be easy. Her explanation may be true, but no one is likely to believe her. So her virtue has been stripped away. Her social acceptance in the community has been stripped away. 
If Joseph had in fact divorced her quietly like he had been contemplating, she might have survived without a death sentence, but she would have been shunned in the community and her life would have been quite different. And again, if he had called her out in public, she would have most likely been stoned to death. Mary's virtue, her reputation, all of it are stripped away, even though she has not done anything wrong. She has, in fact, found favor with God, but society will not see it that way in that time. Her marriage was at risk. Her future was at risk. Her very life was at risk. I can't even imagine all the thoughts running through her head, or for that matter, her family's head. We are given no information about her family and how they may have reacted. Talk about troubling times and potentially feeling hopeless. And what about right now in our world? What else have we had stripped away from us? Well, you've heard me talk about hope a little bit already, so no surprise here, but I would argue that we have had hope in our world stripped away. This year has been one disaster after another. It has been like a low-budget, over-the-top, mega-disaster movie from, or full of D-list celebrities showing on the sci-fi network in the middle of the afternoon. Jobs have been lost by so many people in so many different sectors. Restaurant workers, factory workers, leisure and hospitality workers, retail workers, and so many more are without jobs and income and health care. They are definitely feeling some sense of hopelessness right now as things are, are not really getting any better. Or what about the pandemic numbers climbing back up again? How many times did we hear or think ourselves that this thing would only be a few weeks? And I'm not placing the blame with that question, but rather pointing to our hopes and expectations that this wouldn't last long. We know full well now that this is not a short-term event. I know I have had feelings of hopelessness, and I can only imagine how those healthcare workers are feeling with what they are seeing and experiencing day after day. Or how about the political unrest, the protests, the actions taken by many that have resulted in death and destruction, the anger and rage that seems to continue to boil over in so many arenas of our world. It's frightening. I feel as though we have seen some of the absolute worst sides of people this year. I personally, and I know this applies to many others, but I cannot even turn on the nightly news without first taking a deep breath and praying for some good news to be shared. I don't know how many more stories of death and suffering I can take before I put a child lock on the news stations with the random code that I don't pay attention to so I can't ever access them again. But, as in the past weeks, we need to go back and look at what is left in our scripture reading after those things for Mary were stripped away. And in this case, I believe the answer can be found in verse 37, loud and clear. For nothing will be impossible with God. That's powerful. Like, really powerful. And I don't mean just for us reading it, but it was surely powerful for Mary, too. And I say that because Mary doesn't respond with something like, yeah, that's great and all, but how do I not get killed over all of this? No, instead, Mary says in verse 38, Here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Mary was so confident and comforted by the words that this angel brings to her that she doesn't seem to be that concerned about any of those things that we would expect her to be panicking over or freaking out about. She doesn't run around in a panic. She doesn't run away, try to start over in some place that no one knows her. No. She simply says, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according.
according to your word. Talk about having trust in God. Even with all of those things stripped away, Mary puts her faith in what is still there. The knowledge that nothing is impossible with God. And what about us? What do we find that is still here after our hope in this world has been stripped away? Well, when I first began working on this series, I'd planned to focus on how our all-powerful, loving, and grace-giving God is still with us throughout it all. And that is still true, and it is a great thing to be left with, if you will. But lately, I feel as though there's something else that I have noticed. I notice that even though for many of us we have lost at least some, if not all, hope in the world, I am still finding little bits of hope in people. I know I cannot say for certain as in a measurable way, but I feel like there is more generosity being shown right now. It could be that I am just more aware of it because of the pandemic and because we are more likely to expect to hear bad news rather than good. But I really believe that we are seeing more generosity in people right now. There are people raising money to help those who have lost their jobs. There are celebrity chefs raising money for the restaurant workers who are out of work. There are entertainers raising money for food banks and shelters. Dolly Parton, one of the most gifted country singers of all time and one of the most generous people I have found out, she helped fund the COVID-19 research with a $1 million donation that led directly to developing a promising vaccine. This is the same woman who created the Imagination Library program, which over the last 25 years has given over 147 million books to young children around the world. She's done a great deal more. Just Google her name and you will find a long list of the good work that she has done. And I feel like we are seeing more generosity from people who are not famous or wealthy, too. I can honestly say that I have a renewed sense of belief in the spirit of generosity as I look around and see what several organizations and churches and other people are doing to try to help each other, especially those hit hardest in this pandemic. We believe in an all-powerful God. We believe in a God through which nothing is impossible. And when so many big things feel impossible right now, like an end of this pandemic and justice for the oppressed, I believe we need to remember that God we claim a faith in. That is not to say we should sit back and wait for God to do something, wave a magic wand and it's all better. No, I believe we need to continue to lend a helping hand to one another and let God work through those efforts towards greater things. When we come together, we become something greater than the sum of our parts. We are God's children. And we are called to love God and love our neighbor. We can do it. We will survive this pandemic. We are a resurrection people and believe in life after death. We are the beloved children of a loving and inclusive God, the one who sent his only son to become human and divine and die to save the world, not judge it. We are made in the image of a grace-giving and mercy-showing God. We are coming to the end of the story of the year 2020. But we are nowhere near the end of our story. God is still speaking and the Holy Spirit is still moving. Amen. 
you would join me in our closing hymn number 246, Joy to the World. Beloved children of God, do not be afraid, for God is with you and will strengthen you in your journey through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Magnify the Lord and rejoice, for nothing is impossible with God. And the blessing of God who creates, redeems, and restores be with you now and always. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Have a blessed week.